Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a, really a pleasure to be here. I've uh, spent a lot of time in this community and uh, always uh, uh, value um, the opportunity to come back. So thanks for the invitation. Um, you know, this session, this past session uh, was our short 60-day session. And it was quite intense and we accomplished a lot and really built on some of the accomplishments over the last five years. In the last five years, we've, we've, Washington has really led the way uh, among states in the West and really across the country. Um, but some of the specific uh, achievements, I think, as a state over the last year and helped along by the legislature and by all of you as grassroots advocates and, and business leaders, um, you know, one that particularly stands out is our recovery coming out of the pandemic. We're coming out of this pandemic as one of the healthiest and most economically resilient states uh, in the country, and I'm really proud of that. We've also made huge strides in education and K-12 and higher education and childcare and mental health and healthcare generally. Um, this session in particular was a really uh, important session to support small businesses with some really important uh, tax advantages that came out for uh, small businesses and other supports. Um, and we continue to make great progress in clean energy uh, with Tri-Cities as such an important um, uh, region uh, for clean energy. But we've been able to do all of that, make all of those important investments for the people of Washington State, and do so responsibly with our budgets. And we just found out last week that Washington has retained its AAA bond rating. That's the highest bond rating that you can have. And uh, the rating agencies talked about the responsible budgets and the responsible and large reserve that we kept, uh, which helps us to you know, weather a potential downturn uh, and also um, you know, uh, be flexible in the future. And the last thing I'll just say that stands out from this session was the uh, bipartisanship. 94% um, of the bills that passed uh, were uh, bipartisan. Um, only 17 of the bills that passed were strictly party line, meaning no uh, Republican or Democrat uh, voted for a bill. And uh, that's something that we're really proud of. Now, uh, those 17 bills get the headlines. Uh, so <laughs> there's certainly a lot of media coverage on those bills. So sometimes it seems more partisan. But we all do work together, um, although we occasionally uh, butt heads. Uh, so thank you so much. All right. Senator Braun, your turn. All right. Thank you, Cecilia. It's great to be here. Thanks for having uh, all of us up here uh, and, uh, and, and participating. I, as you might expect, I don't always agree with my good friend Andy Billig, um, but there's one thing he said I do agree on. The, the recovery of our state from a two-year pandemic or during a two-year pandemic has been, in my, my view, phenomenal. It really shows the resilience of our economy here in the state, and I think that that tribute goes directly to the business owners, large and small, uh, across the state, to the employees, you know, across the state, who found a way to get the job done uh, throughout, you know, the, the, the difficulties we all experienced during the last two years. So, uh, my hat's off to everybody. It's not something the state government did; it's something the people did for our state, and they do deserve the tribute. So, uh, we we agree there, at least I think in, in part. Beyond that, I would say, you know, you just said high points, so I'll, I'll cut it short after this, and I characterize. Broadly, this session is one of missed opportunities and misplaced priorities. And what I mean by that, and I'll, I'll, we, we can talk more as we go along, but in particular, the, the missed opportunities, two really big ones. One, as many of you know, we had a $15 billion surplus. That's historically unheard of, 10 times the previous uh, budget in the past. And we missed the opportunity to do real, meaningful tax relief for Washingtonians would have helped in a time where it's getting hard to afford to live here in our state. Uh, we missed that opportunity. And the other thing I think we missed because of that, uh, having to do with that surplus, is the opportunity to fund our transportation system, not in this package, not in this year, but for the next decade, the next two decades, in ways that are sustainable, that are adequate to fund a modern transportation system and ensure our future generations that they're prepared to fu for future success in our state. So I think we missed those two big opportunities. There's lots more to talk about along those lines than others, but I'll cut off there because... Cecilia said to be short. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Representative Stonier, your Thank turn. You. 
Thank you, Cecilia, and thank you all for being here and for having us. We were negotiating, trying to determine who won the longest drive. Senator Braun, I'm not sure if it, which of us wins that I, I one. I came from Moses Lake this morning, oh, so I don't Oh, okay, win. so I win. <laughs> um, driving from Vancouver. Uh, I'll just put a finer point to just kind of highlight your question around what's really stood out, um, and I would agree with um, some of what's already been said. Um, the resiliency is obviously a uh, credit to the people of the state, um, but that is that doesn't mean that there's not something the legislature can do. This year we made incredible investments, um, particularly in the hardest hit industry in the hospitality realm. Um, I've been on weekly calls with our uh, restaurant operators and hotel operators in Southwest Washington um, that organized over the last two years to really help make sure the legislature understood exactly what they were um, dealing with on the business side and was happy to sponsor one of the bills that was in their asks um, this year. Um, but the investments that the state did make with the, with the um, opportunity that we had this year was to make sure that buoyancy continues. And so I'm, I'm quite proud of that. The second thing that stands out to me is really um, the one, another one of the really important investments we made was ensuring that we increase the number of counselors and school nurses in schools coming out of a pandemic when our youth are struggling with um, the toughest years, I think, in a long time and without the care that they need uh, available in the state. Uh, this was the first time that we've actually messed with the funding mechanism to ensure that the money the state sends to schools actually gets spent on those key staff um, that can help in that case. And so um, I think we've learned a little bit about uh, how to drive dollars out in a way that really um, supports people. And so those are the two things that stand out to me from this last legislative session. And looking forward to getting back to it again. Thank you. All right. Representative Wilcox. Well, thank you. And uh, I'll be the fourth to thank all of you for having us. Uh, I used to come to uh, the Tri-Cities quite often in the 80s. My dad would send me over here to buy hay. And uh, it is amazing the transformation that has been made here from a, a place that uh, had uh, certainly some, some great research uh, and uh, a nuclear asset, but uh, at that time seemed most to, mostly to me to be uh, commodity ag. And uh, you've transformed yourself into, I think, the most vibrant economy uh, on this side of the mountains for several hundred miles. And uh, not only in ag, but in everything else, uh, it just seems like you're concentrating on value-added products that are largely recession-proof, and you've done a great job of providing far more housing than we have, uh, I think, in many places in western Washington. As far as the session goes, uh, I would say the high point was uh, the, the two parties together decided uh, to do some uh, major corrections or even rollbacks to the... Uh, police regulation bills that were passed the year before that was absolutely necessary. Uh, among failures uh, was uh, a major failure in that area as well. Uh, we failed to pass reforms that would uh, m clarify the rules around uh, vehicular chases. And uh, that is a big problem for everybody that's trying to keep all of us safe in our homes. Uh, another couple of areas that I'm deeply disappointed in is instead of making housing less expensive and less complicated to build, we made it more expensive and harder to build. And then uh, one other that I'm sure we're going to get some questions about. Uh, it seemed going in like there was some bipartisan space to have effective reforms of emergency powers. They've been uh, stress tested. And we had lots of rhetoric around that, but uh, in the final analysis, we were unable to agree on anything in that arena. Thank you. So um, just to move things along, I think when I ask a question, I'll direct it to two of you, one from each party. But if someone else really has to chime in, <laughs> we'll be flexible. So just let me know. So the, the first question is on taxes. Um, Senator Braun, you... Phrases, you framed it very well. A lot of the chamber members wondered um, about that $15 billion surplus, um, or yes, in state revenues. So, um, Senator Billig, what happened with that? Well, thank you. Um, so, you know, when I think broadly about taxes in Washington state, I think about Washington as a really good value. We're about middle of the pack compared to other states and state and local tax. Uh, burden, 
but we're a high service state. So we're getting, you know, great public schools and higher education and parks and the things that state and local government provide, infrastructure, um, and, and we're about middle of the pack in, in paying for it. So that's a good value. Now that doesn't mean that we can't do better and we should do better. So we did take some of that surplus and we invested in things like we mentioned in K-12 and higher education and childcare and transportation. A large part of that surplus went to investing in our transportation infrastructure, uh, particularly um, maintenance and preservation, which I know was a priority uh, for this chamber on your legislative uh, agenda. But we also did targeted tax cuts. So we changed the threshold at which B&O taxes start for small businesses. It mean, uh, meant 125,000 small businesses saw their B&O tax bill either reduced or completely eliminated. And we also did targeted tax cuts in other areas, as Representative Stonier mentioned, for the hospitality industry. We did some things with their, um, uh, to support them. Uh, and then also uh, another priority for the chamber here was the motion uh, picture competitiveness uh, bill, which we uh, funded uh, a very significant increase. Um, uh, so those are just a few of the examples. But the biggest thing I want to mention again is that reserve. So some people are saying, hey, we should roll back the gas tax and we should do all of these different things with the four and a half billion dollars that we have. But that in reserve, but that four and a half billion is really important, not just for keeping our credit rating, which saves money for the state, for taxpayers, but also so that we're able to weather a potential downturn or other concerns or unexpected events that may happen. All right, I'll let Senator uh, Braun elaborate more on it. He's gonna agree with everything I said, I know it. Well, uh, it's probably unlikely. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't agree. and. and, and Yes, there's a small business tax credit, 120. But, but what is this if you're a small business that makes less than $125,000 a year? That's essentially a sole proprietorship. That is not broad tax relief for the citizens of our state. That's what we didn't get. What we got was uh, over, over $5 billion of new ongoing spending. And there's been the claim, well, we, we got to be careful with this money. We don't know if it's coming back. But there was no hesitation to spend it on more government services. And that's not to say government services are a bad thing, but that's not what the people of the state of Washington need right now. These are, these are folks who are faced with high inflation nationally and even higher in our state. You know, if you could only if barely afford to pay for food and rent six or eight months ago, you can't afford to right now, even if you got a pay raise. It's as simple as that. Our working families around the state of Washington are having trouble living in our state. And we didn't do any meaningful tax relief. relief. And, and there's lots of options. It could be you know, property tax relief. It could be sales tax relief. It could be uh, any number of things that would have hit, hit, helped people directly. And there was just no willingness to do that. And that's where I think we missed the big opportunity. It's about priorities. We didn't need bigger state government. We have a very robust budget. $60 billion now, almost $65 billion. That's twice as big as when I came to the legislature only 10 years ago. Twice as big. It's growing at twice the rate of median, of, of personal income. We don't need a bigger budget. What we need is more money in people's pockets to be able to pay for the things they need to, to, to care for their families. That's what we need. And we just didn't get it. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Okay, the next question is about natural gas, and uh, Representative Stonier, I'd like you to take a crack at this one first. So, um, here's the question. Uh, the State Building Code Council recently voted to effectively ban natural gas in new construction. The cost estimates of using heat pumps versus natural gas will add between $1,000 to $10,000 per apartment unit, depending on the building size and pump type. So what are your thoughts on this decision being made by the council, and does the legislature plan to address this issue in the next session? Thank you for the question. Um, I will take a crack at it, my best, give it my best <laughs> shot. Uh, so we know, and I think from the introduction from the sponsors, um, that the reliability and low-cost energy is key, not only in affordability and livability, but um, also just for the economy to be stabilized. And uh, when we, we had a, a series of bills introduced this last session that took a number of approaches to um, all of our um, natural gas uh, energy resources and tried to um, kind of negotiate what is the best way to keep 
on the direction that Washington State has led the nation in, in green energy. And then the other side of that conversation is what does that do to our building costs and affordability, which is the crux of your question. I think the legislature has a key role in making sure that we um, listen to and watch the efforts that are made um, by local communities and respond in a way that is flexible around the state, recognizing our communities are very different. We do have, um, as I think everybody here would acknowledge uh, a high concentration of legislators elected in the Puget Sound area. And we all come from parts of the state um, that take uh, a little bit longer to listen to, to drive around and to, to talk with folks. And I think the four of us here probably um, represent parts of the state that can help and inform that policy as the legislature addresses it moving forward. Um, I think it's gonna be from the legislative perspective, a balance of staying the course on clean energy, um, but also doing it a way, in a way that can be um, affordable and maintained over time um, for our for our homeowners and our renters and look forward to your guidance on that. Thank you. Representative Wilcox, your thoughts? Well, thank you. Uh, you know, it's hard to think of a topic that didn't get more discussion and more input from stakeholders. People have been talking to me about this for 18 months. Um, these are business people, builders, homeowners, building trades, unions, and their representatives. This has been on the radar, and there is no excuse, uh, I think, at this moment, when among all the many crises that we have in our state uh, is the fact that we've got 250,000 people, 250,000 families in Washington that don't have a place to live because that's what our inventory of housing is lagging. And as I said a few minutes ago, instead of making it less complicated and less expensive to build a home or build an apartment. The legislature made it more expensive and more complicated. And then the governor doubled down, uh, not only in um, demanding that uh, the building code council do this, but in uh, appointing people that are being challenged now because the appointments don't seem to match the requirements of the legislation but in refusing to recognize that this is a humanitarian crisis in our state that is self-caused. Uh, this, is, this is one of the things that I think um, when you go home at the end of a session and look in the mirror is the hardest thing to face. Uh, there's one other thing having to do with uh, natural gas and the fact that in Washington we're making it very much harder to use. It, it's an efficient, uh, low-cost source of energy. It's important for many parts uh, of our economy, and it's especially important here in the Tri-Cities because you have a, a major new employer that has come to town and built a multi-million dollar facility. Uh, it's Dairy Gold, uh, and they did that based on the assumption of energy costs. And if uh, I'm sure that there's a bunch of people here that are in the food processing business, you understand that your heat source is a major part of that business. And it may be that uh, um, natural gas is not the largest part of your energy portfolio, but it's the most critical part for major parts of the food industry. Thank you. So our next uh, topic is on transportation. We touched on that a little bit, um, but um, I think the thing that uh, the chamber members were interested in is that in the past it had seemed that there was a real strong bipartisanship that went into creating that package. And that tradition kind of broke this year is what we understand. So um, Senator Braun, can you elaborate on that? Um, uh, the understanding is that uh, the one side of the aisle was not really at the table from the beginning, so. Yeah, that, that's ac accurate. We have a long history, you know, going back as long as anyone can remember of transportation being worked on a bipartisan uh, manner. And this this year, that tradition was broke. We were literally, uh, and I don't know if Curtis King is still here, but he found out about, he's our lead for transportation in the Senate, and he found out about the, the, the Democratic plan for a transportation package just two hours before it was announced to the public. There was no inclusion in the in the negotiation. And and here's why that why that's important. It's not that we don't support transportation. I think Everybody here supports transportation. We recognize it as a common good. That key, a key part of our, our thriving and growing economy is a modern transportation system. Uh, we support 
the, the big projects, if you want to talk about the, uh, you know, the crossing the Columbia or the Trestle or Highway 18 or 405, these are big projects that may not be in our districts but are part of the statewide system that are important to all of us. Not really that controversial. But then you get beyond that and you get to, okay, did we fund some of the smaller projects? And in transportation, a small project might be a, a $20 million interchange. But it's important, and these are imp important projects across the state. And what you got is virtually none of those projects funded outside, you know, key uh, majority represented areas. It's as simple as that. Uh, the other thing you see is a, a, is, a, is a difference between, you know, how do we fund, you know, roads and bridges versus multimodal versus bike and bike paths. And, and we disagree on those issues, but had it been a bipartisan process, we would have got to a better balancing point, a, part, a, a point that better served all of the state of Washington. And the last thing is in the package that was ultimately passed, well, it's maybe not the last thing, uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, something, uh, the, uh, I lost my train of thought. In the package that was ultimately passed, they didn't take advantage of what I talked about before, which is how do we get beyond reliance on a gas tax to fund our transportation? We know with certainty that, and we've known for a while, gas tax doesn't work into the future. We have to break this three-decade uh, addiction to gas tax and bonding gas tax. And we had a great opportunity to shift some of our revenue from the operating budget to transportation. We have proposed moving, moving the sales tax on motor vehicles to transportation. It's, it's logical nexus. Right? And that not only puts more money into transportation, it does it in a way that doesn't add new taxes and, or fees, and it does it in a way that grows with inflation over time and really assures us that we can not only uh, invest in transportation, we can do it at higher rates with m more, more consistency and less, less partisanship, frankly. And we miss, missed that opportunity. That's a, I think that's a generational opportunity. And instead we have a package, and trans, again, I'll say transportation is very important, we have a package that's based on kind of one-time ideas, a one-time transfer from the operating budget. And that's not a bad thing, but it doesn't solve the bigger problem. Uh, significant new fees that, you know, are not going to be able to be replaced. You can't do it again. You're not going to raise the, the tags for your car another 500% you know, five years from now or four years from now. So we had a chance to solve the problem in a more permanent way, and we missed it. And that's the really frustrating part. Thank you. All right. Senator, you're ready to go, Senator Billy. <laughs> well, you, it. you're to think Senator Broad and I don't get along. We actually, I think we get along well. We actually work together uh, quite closely on many, many issues, but uh, we happen to be touching on some we don't agree on. Yeah, I have a completely different perspective. This was a, a, a really responsible monumental 16-year transportation investment package. And yes, it, it was a different type of package. So in the past, the packages have been very project specific. That's not bad, but that's not as good as saying, we're gonna invest money in really important areas and then we're gonna base it not on sort of the political machinations of where there's support to get, you know, for this project or not, but we're going to base it on need. So this package has the biggest investment in maintenance and preservation for transportation, for roads and bridges of any transportation package ever to pass in the state. And I noticed on your uh, legislative agenda, that was the number one item under uh, transportation. And we funded that into the tune of $3 billion. And what it means is it won't go to the project in my district, because I'm the majority leader, unless that's needed. It just as likely will go to a project in the Tri-Cities. And we also did that not just on preservation and maintenance, but we did it about rail crossings with a grant program. We did it on all of these different areas to say, here's the bucket of money, now let's go fund the need. And Tri -Cities, the Tri-City area is going to compete very well uh, on that. The other thing that we did with this package is we were able to shore up all of the Connecting Washington uh, projects to make sure they're fully funded. So like the Red Mountain projects, to make sure that, because gas tax has been going down, and I'm proud that we were able to pass this package for the first time without an increase in the gas tax, but we were also able to make sure that we compensated for the decline in the gas tax revenues so that all of those Connecting Washington projects from the 2015 package are also uh, funded. And lastly, 
Um, I do want to talk about the investments, uh, particularly in transit, and, and Ben Franklin uh, Transit did really well in this package, as did all the transit agencies, to be able to make sure that we've got the investments for uh, transportation that works for everyone. And uh, the last thing I'll just say on transit is that uh, we made it free for all children 18 and under to be able to ride transit anywhere in the state, uh, and that's something that I think is really important for families and children throughout the state. Thank you. So now we'll move on to energy issues and Representative Wilcox, I'll have you do the opening <laughs> on this one. Um, so over the past four years, the legislature has passed the Clean Energy Transformation Act, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, and the Climate Commitment Act, all of which will increase the cost of fuel, electricity, and ultimately every product we purchase. So what are your thoughts on these policies and what can be done to mitigate some of their negative impacts? Well, thank you for that. And I, I want to say uh, one of the most important Republicans in this arena is in the room. That's uh, State Representative Mary Dye. Raise your hand, Mary, please. She is our uh, caucus lead on the environment. And if uh, you want to know any detail about this, go ask her and uh, sit down with a cup of coffee because uh, she will fill you in. Well, Republicans voted against those things. Uh, it is part of the suite of approaches that uh, has made life in Washington far more expensive. And, and I guess I should correct that because the impact of those haven't even hit yet. Uh, they are going to make life in Washington far more expensive and make a lot of our businesses less competitive. And they're going to do it for a noble purpose. Uh, but uh, they are going after a purpose that Washington has very little contribution to. And uh, I'd refer you to uh, uh, Mary Dye's uh, signature legislation. A lot of times a minority caucus just says no. Uh, House Republicans uh, presented uh, major plans, especially around the environment and transportation this year. And uh, I think that those had a role in the discussion. And uh, I've got confidence that we're going to have uh, legislatures in the future that will discuss these seriously and uh, enact big parts of them. And uh, Mary's plan says, let's, let's uh, take the resources that we have in Washington uh, and uh, concentrate on things that we can actually uh, solve uh, that are not purely aspirational. Let's clean up Puget Sound. Let's build uh, wastewater handling capacity across the state so that uh, all of our major cities in Washington are open for business uh, when it comes to citing new um, processing uh, operations, for example. The one that uh, I think uh, would be at the top of our list for uh, rolling back would be the low carbon fuel standard. That uh, accomplishes almost nothing at a high cost for everybody and has been recommended in California where it was pioneered to be uh, repealed and eliminated. Uh, we have tough times coming in Washington, most likely. Look at the, the world situation right now, especially around um, fuels and uh, energy. Um, it, rather than doing things that are, that are ideological, uh, it's just critical that we measure the actual impacts, I think, both on the people of Washington and uh, the business climate and our environmental climate. Um, don't make these things only good for the heart. Make them good for the heart as well as the rest of the people of Washington. Thank you. Representative Stone, your, your thoughts on this? Thank you, yes. Um, well, I would agree with certainly one thing Re Representative Wilcox just said, and that is that uh, listening to Representative Mary Dye on the floor is an opportunity for me to learn something every time. I can't say that I enjoy listening to all of the members of my good friends caucus at the, at the same level, but certainly Representative Mary Dye has a lot to offer for us, and uh, I pay close attention often when she's speaking for exactly that reason. Uh, as I mentioned before, our energy policy, our, again, an area where we lead the nation in this state, um, is, yes, one that is challenging when you are out in front leading. However, um, I think there's something to be said for aspiration. Uh, I also think there's something to be said for the strength of our economy. As we heard mentioned before, I think you should keep an eye out on headlines because we're going to have an announcement very soon about um, 
industry coming to Washington State for exactly this reason, recognizing they want to be a part of an economy that leads on this issue, and that they can do so because um, the climate here economically and for their business is strong. Um, so I think that while the conversation around our environment policies um, continues to be of the most contentious on the floor, at least in the House, I know that I spend a lot of time out there, um, you know, I think it is definitely an area where um, there is a lot of conversation behind the scenes. We've heard a bit uh, different opinions about how bipartisan it is. It may, the bills may be sponsored on and passed on a partisan level, um, but a lot of conversation happens behind the scenes uh, across both sides of the aisle to make sure that amendments that the minority party might offer can be drafted in a way that we all can agree to so that it doesn't appear that they're just getting turned down. We want to make sure that they can be accepted when, when those amendments and those ideas come forward in a way um, that improve the policy, and that happens quite a bit. And I think that will also continue. Not only will we continue to lead on this issue, but we will continue to work together in ways that don't always show up on a stage um, like today, but um, continues to be the good work we do across the aisle. Thank you. So our next topic is on the future of the Snake River Dams. And on this one, I think we'd like to hear from all of you, if that's all right, just to know what your stance is. So um, the way we're phrasing this is uh, roughly two-thirds of Washington State's electricity comes from hydropower, which is clean, renewable, and affordable. And we might add that in 2021, the Snake River Spring and Summer Chinook Salmon Run was 27% higher than in 2020 and 55% higher than in 2019. But the push to breach the dams never goes away. So what is your stance on that? And if maybe we could just start on this end and um, work our way down just very quickly. From for breaching or not breaching? I mean, <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't uh, know. Yeah, absolutely against uh, breaching the Snake River dams. Uh, Breaching a dam can be a productive thing, and there's a couple in Pierce County that uh, I'd support uh, getting rid of that don't make a contribution to the economy. Uh, these uh, dams are critical for the economy here, and um, we have a whole bunch of different levers to pull when it comes to salmon. Uh, and uh, dams are, are not the only answer. In fact, there's lots of information that shows that that may not uh, be the answer that uh, some would like to advocate for. Uh, we need to grasp the nettle when it comes to uh, predator management. Uh, of the three major things, uh, predator management, hatcheries, and uh, habitat, that's the one that nobody wants to talk about now. But it uh, is uh, an immense and not fully studied uh, impact at this point. Uh, we do work on uh, habitat, and there's a lot of people in this room that have been involved in agriculture's attempts to uh, be the absolute best stewards of salmon habitat that they possibly can. And House Republicans in particular have been leaders in constantly offering budget amendments that allow us to maximize our hatchery capacity in the most responsible way. Go ahead, Rep Representative Stonier. Thank you. Um, so I come from Vancouver where we have, you know, a port that provides all the way up the river and um, beyond. And I know how important that uh, industry is and how important the reach is. Um, the legislature doesn't have a role in a federal decision on the, on the dam necessarily. But I do know that we will continue to stand ready to do some of the work that we've already known is, has, has been done, like salmon recovery. Um, is on the right track because we've done some work to coordinate local government investments with state investments and federal partners to make sure that when we remove fish culverts, for example, we do it in a way that provides a um, direct line for, for salmon recovery rather than in um, very spotty ways, which can often happen when those efforts are not coordinated. Um, so we've invested a great deal there, and that's one of the ways we can help on one of those issues. But um, the, the um, economy that depends on uh, up and down on the river is one that you know starts in my neighborhood and comes right through here. So um, I think we will stand ready to do the legislative legislative um, role in making sure economies are um, prepared and responsive for however the federal government decides to go on this particular issue. Thank you, Senator Braun. Well, uh, I'm not sure that was an answer earlier. I, I'll be more clear. <laughs> I, thank you. <laughs> uh, I oppose the removal of these dams. And look, I, I represent a district that has uh, six hydroelectric dams in it, and, and not the size. 
quite a scale, the, the Snake River dams. But I understand the importance uh, to hydropower, to our economy, to flood control, uh, to transportation. I also understand just how far we've come in managing dams and salmon together, how far we've come in terms of providing uh, fish ladders and others to get the fish uh, through the dam, and that that's not the real issue with these dams. Uh, that's not that, that, that's that's not a cause. These have become just a a, a showpiece for hey, we're, we want to do something. Let's point at something we can do without really thinking about the science. How if we're going to help really Im improve our our salmon runs, let's get at the things the science really tells us are causing the problem. And, and JT hinted a few of this. Some of the, the pedipeds is a big issue. Uh, the the habitat is a big issue. Uh, temperatures are a big issue. But taking big kind of brute force uh, approaches to solving the problem is absolutely the wrong way to go at it. It's destructive to economies, destructive to people's lives, and frankly, it doesn't help salmon the way that we really can if we follow the science. So we have better options uh, around the state. Uh, we are actually doing some of those better options, and, and we should, and, and I guess the one place I do agree with Representative Stoner is this isn't our decision. This is a federal decision. The legislature should stay out of it. But there was that um, $350,000 in the budget to study. My point. We should stay out of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it, someone put it in. So <laughs> go ahead, Senator Billick. Well, uh, thank you. Um, you know, there are enough really hard decisions that we have to make as state legislators and as leaders, uh, that, um, and this is not one of them. Um, so I think the idea, and maybe this is where the 350000 comes, is to say if the federal government were to make the decision, then we have to be ready because the thing that I will just absolutely, you know, and I think all of us probably would, is say if that's going to happen, we've got to make sure there isn't a negative impact on the agricultural industry. We've got to make sure there isn't a negative impact from a transportation standpoint or irrigation standpoint. So to be ready makes sense. And so I, I'm open-minded. I appreciate that there's a consensus about uh, salmon and wanting to support restoration of salmon runs. Uh, I'm also encouraged that there's such a bipartisan um, discussion about this uh, going on, and it doesn't seem to necessarily break down along uh, party lines. So I remain uh, open-minded, but I also know that it's not something that, uh, that we specifically will have to decide. But related to the dams and also just sort of following up on the clean energy um, discussion, um, I just appreciate this community related to clean energy because this is the clean energy capital uh, for Washington, Washington State. It's the center of everything. When you talk about um, uh, nuclear and wind and solar and what's happening at PNNL, um, so as, you know, the world is transitioning and Washington is one of the leaders and Tri-Cities tri is one of the leaders uh, uh, within our state. And so I appreciate that, and I appreciate that here it not only translates to clean energy, but it also translates to jobs. And uh, I think about Tri-Cities a lot as we make these decisions. Thank you. We have two more questions, and these questions are separate and unique, so we'll just uh, get started here. This one is from Brad Toner who wants to know what can be done about the increase in homelessness and crime. Is there somebody who really wants to jump in on that one? No? Sure, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in there. Go, Why not? Go for I mean, it. <laughs> this is, a, this is, first of all, we, we have to recognize it for the scale problem it is. We uh, lead the nation in chronic homelessness. Understand the rest of the nation, chronic homelessness is actually going down. In Washington, it is going up. So that should be your first clue that whatever we're doing right now is not working. Amen. And that doesn't mean, you know, uh, across the board, but we have to really seriously rethink and what we're doing and, and just pouring more money in to the existing approaches is not going to solve it. And that doesn't mean you don't need services for folks who are homeless. You absolutely you do. Uh, and, and they need to be uh, there and available and, and, and consistent. But you also need a balance. You have to have... Both a, you also have to have a structure, and that's really where we're, where I think we're broadly missing. You know, there has to be, to, to put it plainly, you have to have both services to help folks pull themselves out of homelessness and law and order to have, have a structure that encourages folks to, to move that direction. Without, one without the other won't get the job done, and we're trying to, we're trying to do one without the other right now in our state. And, and that's a, 
and there's a whole lot to talk about the causes and how you how you address those causes. But fundamentally, as long as we're unwilling to relook at what we're doing to bring in more structure, I don't think we're going to turn the corner. Go ahead, Senator Billick. Yeah, Thank and I, I actually agree with uh, most of what Senator Braun said. And you know, we I mean, but it does also mean more resources. And I'm proud that we put uh, over a billion dollars into housing and homelessness prevention. Uh, this year, but we do need it to go into a specific type of structure. Too often, I think there's a focus on shelters and just getting people off the street, and that's important. I mean, that sometimes that's a life-saving move, but we need a continuum. We have to have transitional housing, supportive housing. I was talking to somebody who had recently moved into a supported housing uh, unit in Spokane, and he, 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 I said, what do you like about living here? And he said, I like Megan. I was like, who's Megan? Megan's the caseworker here. And he said, I was homeless. I forgot how to live. And I needed somebody to help me to be able to make it in my own apartment. And so you need that supported housing. And then you need permanent affordable housing as well. And so we have to look at the whole continuum. I think we made a big step that, this year. But this is a, this is a major problem that's going to take uh, several years to address. If I could just follow up. So one thing I want to be clear about, and this is not speaking against affordable housing. Affordable housing is a key component. But we should be clear-eyed about this. You know, $800 million into affordable housing, just rough math, that buys you 2,000 houses. All right? We're 250,000 houses behind. That means we'll fix it in 125 years. Right? It's, it, we're not going to fix it with money from the state and affordable housing. We have to, if you're talking about the housing component, you have to engage the private sector in a way that is affordable and effective if we're having any chance of solving this problem. Can't hide behind, well, we put more money into affordable housing and say the job is done. We have to engage the private sector. I'll just add that what you've heard here is um, a description of a problem that's outpacing our resources and it's not a problem we can solve at the legislative level without partners at the city and the county level as well to kind of plan and make um, that kind of varied and um, network of approaches available. Uh, where we do break down in uh, oftentimes conversations is what is the cause and accountability look like? And if we can stay focused on all of the variety of services and needs of people who are living without homes are going to need in order to stay on the path to their own resilience, then we get somewhere. And fortunately, at least in my community in Southwest Washington, where I sit on the council for the, um, for um, housing in, in our community, and my uh, former Republican seatmate, Representative Paul Harris, sits on the board for SHARE. We do have a very bipartisan conversation about what is that going to look like in this community. Our community passed a local tax to help fund um, those efforts, and we're seeing progress, and we're making headlines right now, and we're a little far flung from the resources that come from the legislature, and we're right across the river from Portland, so we have some very unique challenges in southwest Washington. We've been able to over, overcome that in spite of that. And I think it's because we are starting to talk in a more bipartisan way and a multi-government leveled way about what is the continuum of services for people who need help getting off the streets and making sure that we know that if they're dealing with drug addiction, that sliding back in their addiction care is something that happens to everybody. But people who have a home have services that they can go to or care or some program that they can get to. And people who don't lack that. So we need to continue to build those multi-level, multi, -level, multi um, uh, a network of approaches to, to solving this and make sure that the resources, the money that we put into that from the state level have somewhere to go in the network that you've just heard described from the two senators. Well, it's hard to be original when you go last out of four. <laughs> But uh, one of the things that occurs to me is our country and our state has solved this in the past. Uh, in the post-war period, uh, we've seen periods of chaos. We've seen periods of increasing lawlessness. We've seen shortages uh, of homes. Uh, sometimes we've failed to solve it well. Uh, public housing has had a, a checkered past in, in our country. But uh, in many cases, we have done a good job solving these things. And when you think about it, I think uh, when it comes to housing, uh, most people would agree that until the last uh, 20 years, uh, we did everything we could to make it easier to and more affordable for people to own a home. That was a major goal of government policy. 
and they understood that uh, in order to promote home ownership, you had to have affordable homes. And to have affordable homes, you had to do everything you could to fight the scarcity of locations, of places to build, uh, and uh, make it easier for businesses to produce the inputs, less expensive to produce those inputs, and uh, promote policies that created a plentiful workforce. Uh, we haven't been doing those in the state of Washington in the last 20 years. We've especially created huge constraints in the locations where people can build. Uh, I was talking with a, a friend yesterday uh, who mentioned uh, that uh, his development company had 1,200 acres that they could build on along the freeway in Cleella, where a whole bunch of telecommuters are trying to work now. Uh, but regulations in Washington meant that on 1,200 acres, uh, which were not currently being farmed, by the way, they could build about 50 houses. And are they going to put affordable homes on there? No. They're going to be all million-dollar homes because they're going to be large lots. He'd much rather put 2,500 homes there, and he could add all of the services that were necessary to make those efficient homes and make them non-polluting homes. They would be on a place where there's uh, uh, travel capacity, and probably a lot of them would be occupied by people that telecommute. But we can't do that in Washington. That's a huge mistake. The other component of the way that we've solved these problems in the past is uh, we had a relatively stable set of laws that people mostly understood, and we empowered law enforcement to do that. And when we saw injustice, we, for the most part, tried to correct that. And we did it as communities. And what did we do in Washington? Two years ago, we did a huge set of poorly thought out police reforms that were disastrous. They created tragedy for a few people. They created all kinds of unrest and anger for many more. Some people said that they were the best moves we could possibly make. I don't think that's true because Republicans and Democrats this year decided to roll most of those back. That isn't stable law. You know, clearly there must be some injustice on one side or the other because we did two opposite things. And in the meantime, we're the least policed state in the United States and it's getting worse because for a while people just didn't want to join the police force in Seattle. And then we took Seattle statewide and now people don't want to perform as law enforcement officers in Washington. We're not going to turn this around right away. That's a long-term failure. Thank you. Moving on, another question. This is the last of the tough ones, okay? <laughs> so Joel Boucher wants to know your thoughts on Governor Inslee vetoing language in bills that were passed with bipartisan support. Joel asks, what are you doing as party leaders to reassert the legislature's power as an equal branch of government? Oh, there, Sandy. He's ready. <laughs> Go for it. So first, I, I want to recognize that the governor has a legitimate power to be able to veto. That is in the Constitution. And we always say to pass a bill, you need 50 votes in the House and you need 25 votes in the Senate and you need one governor. Um, so that is his legitimate power. And I also want to recognize that the governor's done lots of great things this year and other years. Uh, but I was confounded by a number of those vetoes. They did, the messages did not make complete sense on some of them. Some of them I understood. Um, and I think that the legislature will look very closely at a number of those. And when we come back uh, into session in January, uh, I would expect, I, we haven't talked, uh, but I, my, my guess is that there will be some bipartisan support to uh, override some of those. There was one in particular as a bill uh, Senate Bill 5901. This is actually a really, when we were talking about taxes, I should have mentioned this as well. It's a bill that gives a tax incentive for um, building manufacturing uh, uh, plants or additions. To, so it's a real, it's a manufacturing incentive job. It's a, it, or a bill. It's a, a jobs bill. And it had another component that was really important to communities like Tri-Cities and Spokane, Vancouver, that were a little bit smaller related to a warehouse uh, exemption to make it uh, accessible to smaller communities with a lower threshold. And the governor vetoed that second part related to the warehouses. Um, 
the message I didn't understand, and uh, I'm hoping that we have support to, to override that one as well as some of, the, some of the others, including the one we heard about from Energy Northwest. My answer is very similar to Senator Billig. I mean, I think we were just discussing before I came up here to the table that I pulled up the veto message from 1623 because I was trying to understand why there was a veto to a bill that had um, Representative Mary Dye and Joe Fitzgibbon on there. So, uh, the, again, those questions come up, and it's probably um, on our um, plate of responsibilities to kind of keep that communication line open so we don't get caught off guard and surprised. But I think the governor's staff probably has um, that on their plate as well. And when we get back to the legislative session, I, I think we do exert our legislative um, authority quite a bit. Um, it, and, and so one of the ways we'll do that is by having that conversation about how do we not how do we not get caught off guard with the governor's office when it seems that a broadly supported policy or a budget item has been negotiated, considered, and um, passed with overwhelming support? We'll, we'll get to that. Well, um, first, uh, as much as I would like to say there's no need for any emergency powers, there is. Uh, the legislature isn't in session all the time. There are times when the governor needs to act. And there's lots of of minor emergencies that the governor acts on uh, all the time that none of us are even uh, aware of. And the example that I've used is, well, I don't think that it makes sense to call the legislature into session every time a gypsy moth shows up in uh, the Department of Ag's uh, traps. But uh, I think John and I and others, including Democrats, have, have said since very early in this uh, that uh, it is corrosive to our democratic republic to uh, have ongoing emergencies that don't have a, a logical end, uh, to have the same person responsible for declaring the beginning of an emergency and being the only person that can say that an emergency is over. And I think you're seeing the results of that. You can have a legitimate argument about how long emergency powers should last and which things require legislative uh, oversight, but I, it's hard for me to imagine anyone being able to defend the fact that we still haven't uh, said the, <laughs> that um, the governor can't just keep it going as long as he wants. Um, there were some proposals that were bipartisan. Those weren't brought up. There was a proposal that passed through one of the chambers that didn't seem very effective. And I think what we're seeing now is the results of the legislature failing to really show the governor that this uh, is taken seriously, that we are a government of three different branches. And here's one thing that I know about um, Governor Inslee. He's a very single-minded person. Uh, he concentrates on a small number of goals, and he doesn't really like to count the costs of pursuing those goals. A governor like that can be very successful, but only, only if the legislature is doing its part, which is to consider the impact on everybody else. We have a varied group of legislators. Uh, there's more diversity in the legislature than there's ever been by definition. We, def we represent every corner of the state. It's our job to tell the governor you can't be single-minded on everything. You can pursue your goals. That's why you get elected. But it's the legislature's job to make sure that it works for the rest of Washington. And uh, it's one of those things that's hard to look in the mirror sometimes to be part of a group that has failed to stand up for that concept. Yeah, I'd just say a couple of things. One, I, I want to kind of reiterate what Andy said. Constitutionally, the governor has a veto power. Um, our founders did it that way. But he's also um, uh, abused that power with line item vetoes that clearly are not allowed constitutionally. And, and to our credit, we have, uh, uh, in a bipartisan basis, taken him to court and pushed back and won on those issues. So, but I don't think that's nearly enough, frankly. If we want a legislature to be viewed as a as an equal co-equal co branch of government, we're going to have to be more assertive. I mean, we talked about uh, the bills that were just vetoed, some of which make no sense at all, whether you're Republican or Democrat. We need to be more assertive. We, we let's not wait until January. We can call ourselves into special session tomorrow. We now know after a couple years of practice, we can do it pretty effectively, even remotely. Uh, and we could override those vetoes. If you want to assert the power of the legislature, you have to do it. And, and it, it's no good to say, well, we should be more important. We ought to be more important. We have to assert the fact that under our Constitution, 
We are more important. We have to take action, whether it's with overriding vetoes or weighing in on emergency powers where they simply go too far. And I agree with JT, there's absolutely a, a proper need for emergency power statutes, but not for, for 700 plus days or 800 days. There's a point where we have a responsibility. So you can be upset with the governor, and many people are, but it's the legislature that hasn't asserted itself. We need to assert ourselves, whether, again, whether it's a veto or weighing in on emergency proclamations, we have the power today to do that. We should be doing a better job. And if I could just clarify one thing. I mean, the legislature has asserted itself. The legislature has weighed in on emergency powers. The Senate passed an emergency powers bill. But aside from that, when you look at what currently is in law and how the legislature has the power to exercise its its authority on emergency powers, we have done that. We have done that by uh, continuing some of the emergency procl proclamations. We've done that by not continuing some of those proclamations. Uh, and we've done it by considering even more significant changes and then deciding not to do that. Considering it, having the power to do it, and then not doing it, that is a thoughtful approach. And it's I, I just push back sometimes on this idea that maybe that we've got the legislature has its its head in the sand because I think we all want the same thing with is a successful Washington state and we want effective emergency powers for all the reasons we've said and it's something that we're going to keep working on and I expect an emergency powers bill to come back next session and hopefully to pass. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I want to be clear on that uh, since we're <laughs> speaking up because this is one of the very few places Andy I disagree is. When you say we've asserted ourselves, but the only emergency powers vote we have taken in two years was the first vote in the 2021 session to extend those proclamations indefinitely. That's not asserting yourself. It's just not. Okay. 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 We're going to go. We're going to have fun <laughs> questions now. We'll keep going on the side <laughs> afterwards for anybody that's interested. Actually, we have a list of fun questions. So we're going to lighten the mood just a little bit. So Senator Billig, I'm going to start with you. So we understand you're a baseball fan and you have a special interest in the Tri-Cities. Can you elaborate, please? Well, thank you. I thought all the questions were fun. I just oh, want good. to tell you that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so um, we're a citizen legislature. We all have other jobs. And my other job is to run minor league baseball teams, and particularly in Spokane, and, and ho the hockey and baseball team in Spokane. And that's something I've done for the last 30 years. And our sister organization connected to our company is uh, the Tri-City Dust Devils. And so I come down to Tri-Cities at least once a year, uh, hopefully more, and to visit with the staff and to attend games. I'll be at the game tonight. Uh, and was really um, uh, glad to play a role in 2005. You know, for those of you that were in the community at that time, you might remember that the owners of the Dust Devils at that time went bankrupt. It was a company out of Portland that owned the team. And... Uh, we came in, and I was part of a group that helped to keep the Dust Devils in Tri-Cities, and uh, it's really gratifying to see that organization so well supported by all of you and the whole community and really thriving now at a higher level of baseball and a longer season, and uh, uh, I love that connection to the Tri-Cities, so thanks for asking about that. Yeah, thanks. So, Senator Braun, I don't know if you have a connection to the Tri-Cities at all, but um, the question we have for you is what makes your district so special? Well, I, could you ask what? Could you ask him what makes my district so special? <laughs> you know, if we were to visit, if we were to visit the Centralia you know, we're area, all proud of our districts, and I, I represent great people of the 20th districts, and it's a it's a resource based district, a lot of, of timber, forestry. You know, it's a big district. We go from from White Pass in the in the east to the Willapaw Hills in the west, all the way from just south of Olympia to just north of Vancouver. So a big rural, uh, resource dependent district. Uh, it really is. It, with with great uh, watersheds, we have the Shalish River Basin, which is the second largest watershed in our state after the Columbia. We also ha have a right up against the Columbia River. So we have both of the largest basins. So I think it's, I mean, I mean, we live, we all live in a wonderful state and we should all be proud of the parts we live in. But I think more broadly, we should be proud of the whole state. So I'm not going to take too much pride in the, <laughs> I mean, I am proud, but I am also even more proud uh, to live in this state and to live in this country. So I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. So Representative Stonier, um, what's your favorite spot in Vancouver and why? <laughs> well, I will start with my connection to this region and that is um, as a high school cross-country runner, there's a Pasco Invitational mm -hmm. that was here and I can tell you I trained 
very hard for that. Now I'm three times older and not even half as fast. So, um, and part of the reason is because of my favorite place in Vancouver right now, which is the waterfront where mm -hmm. I am a microbrew lover and a lover of our Washington wines. And we have a waterfront property now when you all drive through. It's a welcome mat to the state um, from Portland, but it is um, spotted with the best uh, IPAs from the, the, the farms here in Washington state and um, highlights our Washington wine on uh, in some tasting rooms that are just gorgeous so I'm there when I'm not busy working walking with my girlfriends and stopping for some wine um, to escape the busy schedule every Saturday morning and you're all welcome to join me if you if you want to join me for that Saturday morning adventure so this area is very familiar to you because the course is right there oh that's wonderful we stayed in the hotel actually yeah, I bet yeah <laughs> that's great so, um, Representative Wilcox, um, we understand that Yelm makes a great base camp for visiting Mount Rainier. Is that true? And what other trails should we uh, take a look at if we're going to Yelm? Well, it's absolutely true, and I'm proud to represent the district that includes Mount Rainier, the most visible district of the state of uh, Washington. And uh, I climbed Mount Rainier with some friends uh, about 13 years ago. And as part of that, I, I looked at some of the history of uh, the early expeditions, which all involved Yelm. And in fact, uh, the first people that, uh, the first uh, uh, recorded people that climb Mount Rainier have streets named after them in Yelm. And they were from uh, Yelm. Uh, Van Trump was one of them. James Longmire was one of the very uh, early ones. Uh, and the history of my district really is the history of the Nisqually River. Uh, and the people that live along it, including the Nisqually tribe, most of whom I represent and have a generational uh, close relationship with. And so if I was going to talk about trails, there's, there's a, a really nice uh, former railroad trail through Yelm. But the fundamental trail uh, of uh, the second district is down the Nisqually. And uh, people used to, used to walk up the Nisqually to get the mountain, and now a lot of people like to floated as well and because I grew up and still live uh, along the Nisqually that means a lot to me. Great okay we're going to close with um, a priority for 2023 and be very quick please. So we're just going to go right down what uh, do you have a certain goal for 2023 next session? Well I've got two that would be easy to do on the first few weeks. One is to uh, pass uh, effective uh, uh, emergency powers reform that would respect the position of the governor and respect the position of the people of Washington. And number two, uh, finally pass uh, effective uh, rules that uh, allow uh, vehicular chases by law enforcement officers. What about you, Representative Stonier? Um, thank you. Uh, I th we passed that bill uh, on the House side, so I think we'll we'll get back to to that discussion for sure. I'm really focused on making sure kids can continue to graduate into a path of career or college of their choice and not be held back by policies that have come both from the federal government but also continue to be really challenging uh, to fight at the state level. Um, one really good example, probably here in this region, I had a bill that would um, allow students to get some graduation credit from their work experience and um, bring a business and an education leader together to assess whether or not that student is college or career ready and hireable. Um, so I'll keep working on that. Yeah, real quick, uh, very clear. We need to focus on public safety. How do we return our state to a safe place for our, our children and our families? Uh, how do we make our state affordable? We should be view, viewing every piece of legislation that comes in front of us through a lens of affordability. What's it going to do to working families around our state? We should be focused on education, in particular, getting after the learning loss our children have suffered over the last two years. We have not done enough to correct that mistake and, get, and, and, and them not being in school, in most cases, for a year plus. We have to get after that to be successful. And finally, uh, I hope we have the chance to rethink long-term funding for transportation. Well, I think uh, as we do representing 49 distinct districts around the state, I think we're, we're going to listen. And we probably don't know yet what the big issue is going to be uh, for the next session. So we'll be out uh, certainly listening to our communities. Uh, for for to know exactly how we need to respond. But I think our con continued economic recovery and jobs is something that we'll always be focused on. And to make sure that recovery is working 
for everyone, because there's certainly a lot of people and companies doing well coming out of the pandemic, but it hasn't touched everyone. We've got to make sure that recovery is really broad. And two others I'll just mention very quickly, broadband, we've done huge investments. It's, it's an economic imperative, healthcare, education, it touches every part of our life now. We need to keep moving on that. And the last one on education, we've done great strides in education, but we still have more work to do in special ed. I think that'll be a high on the priority list in K-12 uh, for next session. Thank you so much for participating and visiting the Tri-Cities. It was lovely having you, really. It was a very insightful discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>